Good evening, church family. Woo! Glad y'all made it back. We're going to start with number two. Number two, if we're using the book. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine glory, revive us again. All right, moving on. Number 214, 214, if you're using the book. Then we're having our first prayer. I just kind of thought this song should have started with the chorus. But. Have you ever stood at the ocean with a white foam at your feet? Felt an endless thundering motion that I'd say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the sunset with a sky mellowing red? Seen the clouds suspended like feathers? Then I'd say you see. Jesus, my Lord, have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the cross with a man hanging in pain? Seen the look of love in his eyes, then I'd say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with a Lord there in your midst? 
Christ in the face of Christ in your brother, then I'd say you've seen Jesus my Lord. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this evening service, for the privilege that we have to be your children, and what a blessing that it is to be knowing that we'll be with all the redeemed that has gone before us when we pass from this earth. We're so thankful for the blood of Jesus that purchased this church that we're a part of. We're thankful for the plan of salvation that we've obeyed to get to where we are in Christ. Father, we're thankful for the measure of health that we have, but we're mindful of the sick and the ones that are bereaved right now. We pray that you'll be with the Zajac family. Pray that you'll be with David Burke and others that, uh, and Judy, and others that we may not know about or fail to remember. We pray that you'll be with them in their healing. We pray that they can begin to assemble with us. Father, we're thankful for the love that exists in this church here at Elk City and throughout the world. And when we travel, it seems like we have family, and we do everywhere we go. And we're thankful for their teaching that they've learned to do that from you. Father, we're thankful for Shane and his ability to lead us in these songs. We ask you to continue to bless him with that ability. We're thankful for... Uh, Gand, as he is about to break into us the bread of life this evening, we pray that he'll remember the things that he's got to say to us because he does such a good job. We're thankful for his wife, Julie, as she backs him up in his ministry. Uh, you know that a good wife is very hard to find sometimes, but when you do find one, it's a blessing from you. We pray, Father, for our elders and their wives. We pray that you'll give them strength to continue to lead this church. Father, we ask that you help us center our minds on you, help us to truly consider what we're doing, and to remember that a week from today, we're going to be assembling again to break bread, and we help you to help us meditate upon this week as we approach another first day of the week. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you're marking your book for after the lesson, it's 517. 517 after the lesson. So before the lesson, we're going to sing 731. 731 for right now. Then we'll have our lesson. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to see. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. Abiding in Jesus, like him that shall be. Thy friends and thy conduct his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. The 
us led by his spirit to fountains of love. So soon shall be fitted for service above. Ole. Okay, I, I had at least two people tell me they got their nap. Got a good nap this afternoon. I'm not going to throw names out, anything of that sort. And so the idea was, at least, they were ready to, they were ready to, ready to be awake for, I guess, most the, of the duration of the sermon. Let's just put it that way. But it is good to see each of you. It's good to be here tonight. Now, on a, a different note, we did get word this, this evening that Merle Gore, she, did, she passed away this afternoon about 4 o'clock. So let's continue to pray for her family now for their comfort during this time with Merle's passing, her, her family and, and friends, even some here this evening. I invite you to take out your Bible tonight and look with me at a very biblical topic, but what can be, and I'm, I'm already being a bit facetious because you know, even saying it can be is probably a, an understatement, but what can be a rather controversial topic. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. It's our first passage that we will consult here momentarily. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? Who are we talking about when we use that phrase, when we read that phrase? We read about the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit, sometimes simply the Spirit in the scriptures or in other writings, religious writings and conversations. Over the years, some have suggested that the Holy Spirit is a mere force, an impersonal force. And I'm not trying to straw man or stereotype something. There are, there are people that have actually written it down and said things like, the Holy Spirit is a force like electricity. They've said that. So I'm not making a joke out of it or anything. That's what some have said. The, the newer comparison is that maybe the Holy Spirit is like, how many of you are familiar with the force in the Star Wars world? Anybody? We got any? Okay, okay. Even if you're not a fan, you probably know what I'm talking about. This, but the similar idea of, of, of a power, a force, but pretty impersonal. It's just, a, it's just the force. What a, some have said the Holy Spirit might be like that. Just God's power at work. It's when God acts and we see his power, that's what's called the Holy Spirit. Or, and this is where if you're filling out the handout, you're going you're to put the word B-I-B-L-E right there. There aren't many who claim this, although I have heard some say it. It's pretty rare. It, this one is far more of something that happens by implication than the first possible idea of a force and this is that the Holy Spirit is just the Bible. The Bible is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the Bible, I guess. And that's all there is to it. It's just the Bible. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? Instead of spending our time on some of the ideas that exist in our world and that men have written down and given their ideas, let's turn to God's Word, to, yes, the Bible that I, I already, I mean, we're kind of answering some questions, but for the sake of a sermon that the Holy Spirit gave, had, did give us to find out more about the Holy Spirit. And so before us this evening, let's consider his person first, his person, then his work, what he does, what he has does, done and what he does, and then some cautions and questions, some cautions and questions as we bring this, these thoughts tonight to a close. The Holy Spirit, his person, his work, and then some cautions and questions. We begin then with his work. And let's now, if we haven't already, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Or his person. I said his work, did I? Didn't I? I no, I didn't. I didn't, okay? It's recorded, but I didn't say that, all right? It's his person, all right? It's his person. 
Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to like wind. And even the Hebrew and Greek words for wind and breath and spirits align. And so Jesus says, it's, it's, you can think of the Spirit that way. That he, it's not that you visibly see him. And when you think even throughout biblical history, when the Holy Spirit is said to have been involved in something, there, it's not, there's rarely a visible appearance. This is one of the few times when you get something that is physical or visible, but it's not like we're seeing a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's more of a, a symbol or a representation. But under the idea of his person, you might notice the word individual. He is an individual member of what we sometimes call the Trinity or the Godhead, the Godhood even. He is God. He is divine. He possesses the qualities of God, just like the one we typically call the Father and the one we typically call the Son or Jesus, the Word God made flesh. And he is his own individual member of that godhood or that trinity here's a good example of that in matthew chapter 3 it's a good example of the spirit appearing in a visible way and of his individuality matthew chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 this is when jesus has come to john to be baptized or immersed by him at the beginning of his ministry so we read that when jesus was baptized immediately he went up from the water and behold the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God, visible appearance, descending like a dove, thus the symbol or representation. The Spirit isn't a dove, but he sees some physical manifestation that is like a dove coming down out of the clouds, out of the heaven, the sky, and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And so this is one of the times when you have a very distinct, very clear picture of Jesus, who is in the flesh, being baptized, of the voice of the one that, from the context, we can identify as the Father, and then the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Now, why is this important? Well, aside from the fact that it's, it's a, a biblical idea, there are some who also claim that the Holy Spirit, along with that idea of a force, then it is not an individual part of the Trinity. It is, maybe it's the Father and Jesus, and then their power is the Holy Spirit. Now, some will take it to there is just one, and there's three different ways they appear. And There have been a, a lot. It's a, night, it's a Sunday night sermon. This is not meant to be a, a rehearsing of different ideas in church history about the Trinity and the Holy Spirit but to perhaps touch on some of them by mainly looking at what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. And then a couple of other passages, and I think I actually have three on the handout, to look at on your own some. You can read through the three chapters, John 14 through 16, and notice the grammar. Notice how Jesus referred to himself with words like I and me. Then he'll refer to the Father, and he'll refer to the Holy Spirit sometimes in the same sentence, and they're all three distinctive. They're working together in perfect harmony and unity, but you have things like Jesus saying, the Father will send the Holy Spirit from me to you. And they are, there is this individuality that is present. Again, they are not separate. They are one in harmony, but they are individual, and the Holy Spirit is a part of that individual nature. It's a part of his I'm, I'm cautious about using words like even person and personhood. I mean, it's on the outline as person. But for, for the, the limits of English, the English language break down. We could say his individuality is a part of his personal or his personhood. And that is our second word under his person is that he is personal. He's personal. It's not just that he's an individual member of the Trinity. He is relational or personal like the Father and the Son. And here's where you might put the word mind or intellect and then the word heart or emotion. If you really like the, the shoal words, you could do emotional or, or intellectual and 
emotional, and that's up to you. But something, the idea of head and heart here. Now, we do not fully understand, I don't think anybody does, it's human, just human, how emotion works with, with deity. The Holy Spirit doesn't have the chemicals that we have in our, in our brains and bodies that connect to our emotional states. But throughout the Bible, God is described with emotional terms. And so we have what we have. And if we're going to make something and say something, it needs to be from Scripture, right? And so the, the mind of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, let's read that one together. Acts 10, 19, and 20. This is when Cornelius has received his vision about going and sending for Simon Peter. Go get Simon Peter, and he'll tell you a message that will save you and your household. It is worthy of note that throughout the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is very active. It's been said that instead of Acts of the Apostles, this book should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, working through the Apostles and others. But it's worth noting that there's never one example of where the Holy Spirit just talks to someone that isn't a Christian and helps them become a Christian. Never happens once that way. Now, the Holy Spirit will be involved very directly, often in guiding someone like Peter here or the, the, the Philip with the eunuch in Acts 8, a couple of chapters earlier. But it's about connecting a messenger, a human messenger, with a person who needs to hear the gospel. That's what we see here. But for our main intent here, notice the way the Holy Spirit is described, how he speaks. Acts 10, 19 and 20. It says that while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Look at the personal, the personality that's here. The Holy Spirit has this intention and has the ability to communicate. He's an able communicator in Acts 10, 19. And 20. Or the two other verses on there. The other one is 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It's in the middle of a lengthy discussion about spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts, the ability to speak a language you'd never studied, to heal someone, and, and so on. And in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to various ones. It says, according to or as he will. Have you ever thought about the Holy Spirit having his own will, his own desire and purpose? He does. He tells Peter, you go because I, I've sent these people to you. I'm sending you now to go give them the gospel. In 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, there again, the human author is the Apostle Paul, but he says the Holy Spirit says or states expressly and then it's about those that are going to come soon in the last days and begin to teach things that are false in the rest of the passage. But observe with me that there the Holy Spirit is here, once more, a very good or effective communicator. This is not some very vague feeling the Apostle Paul got or something along those lines. It's very specific and intentional. He has a mind that searches, the Bible also says, and then delivers. He's personal. But then he also has what I'm calling here a heart. A heart. Let's stay in the book of Acts. If you're in Acts 10, go back with me five chapters to Acts 5. Acts 5, at the beginning of the chapter. This is near the beginning of what we've come to know as the church. Acts 5. We read this, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Mark that down. It is possible to lie to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see something else here as we finish the passage. But, and you could put that under both here, the mind and the heart, being capable of being lied to. To, to put it in question, 
Think back to what we asked earlier. Can you lie to an impersonal force? I love that you can, you can even do that, aside from this other pa- the other passages. But here, possible to lie. But I put it in the more emotional side because of the, the, the idea of lying or betraying someone, being a more emotive thing. Not that the Holy Spirit didn't know what was happening. How did Peter know what was happening? Through the Holy Spirit. Let's keep reading. Is this why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to the Holy Spirit. And that's what he said earlier. Is that what your Bible says? You can't read mine from there, can you? No. Peter says, to God. At least implying, even in this passage, and there's plenty of others that are even maybe clearer, but this is one. Not only can you lie to the Holy Spirit, but when you're lying to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God, implying that the Holy Spirit is divine, or is also God. Now, through verse 12 is the end of this account, and as we read this, things do not end well when one lies to God, the Holy Spirit. And then, we have a number of passages that give us more insight into the Holy Spirit's behavior, his heart. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, tells us that it's possible to insult, not only to lie, but to insult the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace can be insulted or spited, depending on your English version. Along those same lines, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we were basically there this morning, in verse 29, after telling us to be careful about our speech as Christians in 29, Ephesians 4, 30, tells me, tells us, that it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. And, And I don't know for sure, but I've wondered in the past, when I look at the context, if it's not related to our speech, because that is the Holy Spirit's seemingly tool of trade. He works with words. That's his specialty, is communicating God's word through writers and speakers. So perhaps it is that that is what is especially hurtful or distressing to the Holy Spirit. It's when we take the power of words and use them for purposes like corruption and deceit and profanity. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. I don't know if we talk enough about the Holy Spirit and about our relationship to Him and about the possibility of our lives and how we affect the Holy Spirit. We can grieve Him. And then in Romans chapter 15, verse 30, it's a a by-the-way statement. It's not not the point of the passage. But in describing His plans and His hopes about some of His trips and missionary work in Romans 15, It's in verse 30 that the Apostle Paul refers to what he calls the love of the Spirit. Now, since it is not clarified here, is that the love? Some have said maybe that's just a love that comes because we follow the Spirit, it's our love. I'm going to take it here as at least possible that he's referring to the fact, and it makes sense, that the Holy Spirit loves us. When was the last time we thought about that? We talk about Jesus' love, the Father loving and sending the Son. If we wanted to put it back in somewhat of his specialty, what would we know about Jesus if not for the Holy Spirit? Now, we're overlapping with his work a bit, and that's going to happen. It has to, because most, a lot of these passages refer to who he is, but also what he does, and what he has done in revealing the gospel message. So could it be that the reason we can grieve his heart with our words is also because he cares about us and loves us? Do we love him? Hmm. I said we're not going to get too deep for a Sunday night, but he is personal. He loves and is capable of being lied to, but also then wouldn't all this mean he's also capable of receiving love? And then one more, under his person. We've seen his, he's individual. He's in union, but, but in one sense he is distinct or separate from the other members of the Trinity. His, his personal, and then he is eternal. 
Let's read that one before we have to move on. Hebrews chapter 9, 13 and 14. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. He is eternal. Now, if he is divine, as we have established, then that should not surprise us, but it is an important point to make. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. It's what it says, For if the blood of bull, of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, if those sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience, it's a bit of a, a heavy sentence, from dead works to serve the living God. Now once more, he's not... The point he's making is not you need to know the Holy Spirit's eternal. It's about Jesus' sacrifice made through the Holy Spirit. But we're reminded here of the fact that the Holy Spirit is divine in every sense of the word, including that he had no beginning and will have no end as we think about it. He is eternal, his person. Now we turn our attention a bit more to his work. As noted, we've already seen some of this. His, he, he works with words and speaking things to the prophets and apostles of God. But let's focus a bit more on that. Two words can be used to summarize his work. The word revelation, that one should be on your handout. I believe the next blank is going to be confirmation. Revelation and confirmation. For revelation... Consider for 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. We turn a few pages from Hebrews to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, 18 through the end of the chapter. We pick up, actually, we pick up in verse 18 with the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm going to begin reading in verse 19 when he says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke, we could say also wrote, right, from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I'm reading, as it has now been written down, the words of prophets and spokesperson for God. When I'm reading the Apostle Paul's letters, when I'm reading Jeremiah's prophetic works, I'm reading something that comes, the real, the real source is not those men, but the Holy Spirit. Now, how, how all that works, we do not know. But we do know that it is, it is verbal in nature. They were not given some ideas and then you go just write whatever you want with these ideas. Here, here's, here's a brainstorm session with the Holy Spirit. Now you take that and write what you want. We also do know the Holy Spirit is so powerful. He was able to do so through the vocabulary and personalities and backgrounds of the human authors. That's part of why we have different styles and personal notes and differences in the level of writing. Luke, as a physician, for instance, does not write the same way that Peter does, even in the, the, the style of Greek that makes its way into our English. That's just how powerful he is, that they were carried or that was produced by the Spirit's work. We've already, know, we've already seen in Acts how the Holy Spirit works to connect people, and help people to know God's message about Jesus. Revelation. It's one of his main jobs throughout history. And I don't mean job in a negative sense at all. It's to reveal God's message. The eventually, primarily, in the end, the gospel message. But then, right there with that is confirmation. We were in Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews. From 2 Peter 1 to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. This passage is one of the reasons I'm not real, can I say hip on in a sermon? I think I can say that. I'm not real hip on the, the idea that Paul is the author, the human author of this 
letter because the writer writes here from a, a second-hand standpoint, not like one of the apostles, but someone who came along a bit later. That, that, that's another discussion, perhaps for another time. But he says here, therefore, we must pay more, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift from it. For since the message was declared by angels, proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. And he's referring to the old covenant. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also, watch this part, bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts, it's also a mouthful, of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. The apostles and eventually others began to go out into the world and take the gospel like Jesus commissioned them to do. How do I, how do I know that what Paul is saying, or even Peter, or any of the others, how do I know that this is from God? I can compare the, the scrolls, the scriptures in the Old Covenant, and they did that. But I can also see how the word was confirmed by the miracles they performed. The Holy Spirit has worked in both revelation and confirmation. Now for further consideration, you can read John 16, 13 through 15, where the Holy Spirit is said to come to the apostles there and reveal all truth. All truth, the idea is that was needed for Christianity. Or the spirit who knows the mind of God and is able, has, Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 2, has revealed. By the way, the passage about I not having seen and ear heard, the things God has prepared for those, that's in 1 Corinthians 2.10. It's a quote from the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul says it has been revealed. It's about Jesus and the gospel and we give thanks and owe the Holy Spirit for taking that message and making it available even to us today. His person, his work. Now let's get to the fun stuff for just a minute or two. Some cautions and questions. Some cautions and questions. Caution number one. Watch out for grammar. I know some of us like grammar. Most of us don't, and that's okay. You don't have to like grammar to get this part of the sermon. One of the things to notice is because of the Holy Spirit, because he is personal, he is a he or a him. And part of what sometimes can throw us off is because there are some English versions that will translate it or itself. And it sometimes it throws people off. And that's where they think, well, it's in my Bible that it's the Holy Spirit's an it. Well, we're here tonight to say he's not an it. He's not an impersonal force from Star Wars, okay? He's a personal being. Who, get, who, is able, who is relational and communicative. The other thing to watch out for is the capitalization. Capitalization. A good, if you want to jot down a good passage to look at as an example, Romans 8, the whole chapter, but I put down in, in my own notes 14 through 16. And in those three verses, you'll see at least two, if not three, different meanings. And it's the English word spirit all three times. Keep in mind that the translators, they make the call on whether it's a capital S or not. So is it our, our spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit? Sometimes the word spirit can mean something like attitude or demeanor, an angry spirit in that way. A couple of things to keep your eyes out for or cautions about grammar. Pronouns, that's a big, big deal in our world right now, right? Well, pronouns here matter, okay? Pronouns and capitalization, something to keep out. A fun way to do it is to write it out or type it out, a passage you're trying to unravel, and make all the S's in the word spirit lowercase. And then you can just look at the context and see. Second one, what about today? That's your last word there, today. What's the work of the Holy Spirit today? That's where it gets a bit controversial, right? What about miracles today? I've got a sermon plan down the road just on that, so we might not spend a lot of time right now on that. I will say the word was confirmed in the first century, and I don't know how many more confirmations you need. Beyond when God confirms something, he does so completely. But how does the Holy Spirit work? 
I'd suggest to you, as you study the scriptures, I see no, no, nothing to convince me that the Holy Spirit is going to operate directly on someone's heart and make them a Christian, especially uh, somehow outside their own will. I don't see that at all. What about for the Christian, too? And here's where I'm going to say this. I don't know. I don't know that there's enough information to fully know how the Holy Spirit works. I'm cautious about assuming that he does something or doesn't do something that I don't have a very clear thus saith the Lord on. In other words, if the Holy Spirit hasn't told me in his confirmed written medium, I'm very cautious. An example that can go two ways. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, tells us to, do, to not do what? Don't get drunk, but instead be filled with what? Or whom? The Spirit. And then even in the English grammar, it keeps going. Out of that then comes the speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? Our singing. It's based in being filled with the Spirit. People who are filled with God's Spirit, one of the things they will naturally do is get together and sing to one another and to their Lord. Now the parallel passage is Colossians 3.16. It says to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And then says the same thing basically in parallel. To teach and admonish with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Same idea. Now some take this and they, they use this to say that the Holy Spirit is just the Bible. <laughs> I don't know about that side, but I also am reminded of how the Spirit, I know he works through his word. Beyond that, I can easily begin to tread into some sacred territory. And maybe I need to be very light-footed, especially in a public way, in a sermon, let's say. I do know he does that. Some have compared the Holy Spirit, his, what we do know about his work, to an axeman chopping down a tree. And sometimes we feel like we're getting chopped on by his word anyway, right? But that's not the point. But the Holy Spirit is working but he does show through the implement of his word. What does he do beyond the word? Well, that's where it gets a bit difficult. And we, we can't lose sight of basic Bible study tools. And that's kind of going to be your third one there too. Of how it's easy to blame the Holy Spirit on some of our bad ideas. Some read Jesus' words to the apostles in John 15 when he says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. I've had people tell me that. I've got the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth. I don't even need the Bible. Or maybe I use the Bible and I, I, the Holy Spirit tells me some things. Well, then you ask them about John 14, 26. You ever looked at John 14, 26? It's in the same context when Jesus meets with the apostles on that night and he tells them the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all things. It's sometimes it's translated everything that I have said. Now, somebody could memorize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and th this doesn't work quite as well, okay? But uh, most people aren't doing that. Can you do that? Now, the takeaway here is not to say that, again, the Holy Spirit is just the Bible. That's not the point at all. But to be cautious about going the other way too far and beginning to suggest, well, we need to do this, or I think this is okay, and my justification is, well, I, I, the Holy Spirit put this to me. And, and something I've observed is if we're not careful, we begin to rely on our feelings. As we've already seen, the Holy Spirit, he didn't work that way. Even when he inspired Paul to write a letter, he didn't give Paul an upset stomach or an urge or some feelings that then Paul wrote his letters based on. And this is serious, okay? So this is not a joke. If you laugh, it's okay. But I think about the Christmas carol and Scrooge. Does anybody remember what he thinks Marley is? Now, the bad part of this is that in the story, it's, it, the ghost is real, okay? So that, that's kind of the, that, that's the opposite here. But it, part of his suspicion, his skepticism is he says, maybe Marley, maybe you're a bit of, of undigested beef or you're a crumb of cheese or an undone potato. You're the figment of an undone potato. Word of warning. It seems sometimes that we get ideas, and they may just be our own ideas, 
but we get a certain feeling or a certain urge, and we think, eh, yeah, that, that, that's probably the Holy Spirit giving me an idea. So you might be careful about that. And you can look and see just how many ideas and doctrines have been developed and blamed, unfortunately, on the Holy Spirit throughout the centuries. Because if the Holy Spirit revealed this word and confirmed this word, then I might be careful about saying something that for sure contradicts this word, but I might be also careful about saying something that is supplemental even, that supposedly comes from the Holy Spirit. Cautions and questions. Does the Holy Spirit work in the life of a Christian? Amen. Do I, can, I, can I tell you every detail and exactly what he's going to do and not going to do apart from the word? I'm not going to stand up here and say this is what he does or doesn't do apart from that. And I'm cautious about context because the, the scriptures, the New Testament was written to people in the first century who had inspired apostles and prophets who confirmed what the Holy Spirit told them by going so far as raising people from the dead. That's a whole different story than somebody coming up and saying, I think we should do worship this way, and the Holy Spirit told me that. The Holy Spirit, his person, he's personal. He is real, and he's not some force. He is God. His work, his work has focused, I'm not trying to put him in a box, but his fo work has focused in on revelation and confirmation of God's word. Some cautions, some questions, perhaps some things to pursue at, an, at another time or on our own. Although we may not be able to figure it all out, answer every question, and remove everything on the list, we can know the Spirit. We can get to know Him. We can love Him, appreciate Him, and grow because of His work in giving us and helping us to know the truth of the gospel. What if the Holy Spirit wasn't there? What if the Holy Spirit had not worked to reveal and confirm the message? Now, that, you know, what ifs are a whole other game, and I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. But aren't you thankful? Aren't you appreciative and glad that the Holy Spirit works and has a desire to give us God's word and to work even providentially, let's say, to help us to come to know and know better our God and how to live for him. So that's the point of the sermon when we say, where are you? Where are you tonight in your relationship with God, with your relationship with the Holy Spirit? We sing songs about being guided by the Spirit. Does my life at least reflect what I do know He has said in His Word? If not, maybe I need to make some changes in my life. As we've said recently, it's not about perfection. It's about loyalty to the King. If we can help you tonight to change things, to make things right, so that you leave here this evening right with God, a Christian and a Christian who's walking by the Spirit of God in, in love and faithfulness. Won't you let us know? We stand together and sing. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross a Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. 
heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proper. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down in glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was stirred to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. One, there's, there's a whole phenomenon with how our ears, our brains, hear and interpret song lyrics, right? And that happens with all types of music, all types of lyrics. Well, the song we sang earlier where he's, Have you seen Jesus my Lord? The first time I remember at least singing that song, we were attending a congregation in Hazel Green, Alabama that is still known today as the Plain View, all one word, Church of Christ. You see where I'm going with this? When I started singing that as a young child, I was about, I was younger than Jed. I heard that as here in plain view, as in here at this congregation, here at plain view, not plain view. It took me a while to realize, oh, okay, it's a whole different meaning then, although similar, I guess, in the end. And then something else to think about tonight. When it comes to discussions about God's word and how God speaks today and things like that, I'd like you to consider the benefit, aside from the question of you know, the Bible and, and God's Word, aside from that, I'd like you to consider the benefit of a written medium. Someone gave the example years ago of you go with some friends to see a movie, a very visual presentation, and then you ask them afterwards, what was the movie about? Can, what, what, what were your feelings on the movie? Can you tell me about the movie? And you are, you're, it's normal to get some very different answers. Now, do people always understand the Bible alike? <laughs> no. But it's a different medium. It's at least easier to be on literally the same page when it's something that's written down. You don't, it's different to interpret a picture or a visual or even something someone says. It's different when it's right here written down in black and white. And if someone says something, even in a sermon, and it doesn't quite sound right, I can go back to the source, like the Brians, and say, well, this is what it says written here in this, what the experts call a settled, cold medium. Where it's, it's right here in the page. Now, the potential downfall of a cold medium is that it can sit on your shelf. It's not going to come to you and wake you up and say, hey, here's the message. I have to intentionally pull it off the shelf, crack open the pages, and read it. You're different. But it's a settled, cold medium. Something else to kind of chew on this evening.
let's sing number 71, then have a word of prayer and be dismissed. If you're in need of partaking of the Lord's Supper, we have it prepared for you. Make your way to the back door where you came in. We have somebody there to take care of that for you. If you want to stand and join me, we're going to sing As the Deer, 71. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship you. Our Father and our God in heaven, we come to you now knowing that we're speaking to you through your Holy Spirit as we all pray together tonight. God, we know that you are holy and you're so holy that we're not worthy to even speak to you directly, but we're so thankful that you spent, you sent your helper, you sent your Holy Spirit intercede for us and to remember the things we forget to say in prayer, to say things right in the way that will be holy and acceptable to you. And we, we thank you so much that you do that, and we don't think about that a lot. God, you've done so many things to set things right in this world that we've broken, that mankind has destroyed, mankind has perverted. You've been over backwards and gone completely out of your way to make things good for us through your grace. We're all here tonight living examples, and I'm sure many ways, of your grace and your mercy. We've all gone through trials and hardships, but you've always come through for us. And you always will, and that's why we're here tonight. That's why our faith is how it is, and that's why we long for more and more faith. And we all can't wait for that day when we get to see you face to face and be holy with you in your presence. Help us to remember always, especially as we leave this evening, that is the goal. To be as much like Jesus as possible and to be welcomed into your home someday. God, please be with the ones that um, we've heard about tonight that have gone on to the other side with you. Be with their families that are remaining. Comfort them in a way only you can. Be with those of us that are sick, that have gone through surgery, that are having health complications. We ask that you would have your healing hand on them, and if it's your will, that you'd bring them back to health. Father, we thank you again for your spirit tonight. After the sermon that we've heard, and after all Gantz brought to us and presented from your word. Help us to remember that your spirit is more than just some afterthought that we should think about sometimes. Your spirit's living inside of every Christian here. And he does so much more than we realize. Help us to keep that in mind. Help us to listen to your word and listen to our conscience and to ever be in mind that we're to be more and more like Jesus every day. 
And we pray all these things in his holy name. Amen.